Uh, hello, Mr. Roman, uh, Dr. Roman. It's a, a really uh, pleasure to have you here with us on India AI to speak about the other side of AI. We always tend to focus on the bright side of AI, the positive part, you know, what are the benefits it brings to the society. But then there is always, uh, as with the many technologies we have seen in the last few um, you know, centuries, there is another side of AI. So uh, welcome to uh, India AI's uh, India AI Conversations. And uh, so, uh, and it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I never been to India. This is the closest I got so far. So we'll see how it goes after the pandemic. <laughs> definitely, definitely, you're always uh, most welcome uh, to India. So, uh, Roman, uh, my uh, first uh, question to you is: uh, Can you describe, like, we speak about cybersecurity? I mean, uh, we speak about cybersecurity. I mean, for a long time ago. I mean, when growing up, the major threat used to be, you know, Trojan or uh, issues like virus, you know, those are the things. But as technology evolved, you know, as AI itself evolved, we are seeing uh, different ways of uh, issues, right? I think, uh, you know, uh, malware with social engineering capabilities and, you, you know, you have seen the situations with deep fakes. So can you explain how the nature of cybersecurity uh, you know, threats essentially evolved as a result of advancement in AI? Right, so when we talk about AI safety, we uh, not just concentrate on attacks from outside. So a hacker getting access to your project, modifying code, modifying your data, but the system itself becomes very capable and either intentionally or as a side effect can cause damage to cyber infrastructure, to, to people. So those are the two aspects of AI safety and security, protection from external forces, and control over internal system itself. More and more standard cybersecurity relies on AI both to defend cyber infrastructure, to automatically detect novel types of exploits, to monitor traffic, and hackers utilize AI to find new ways to attack, to automatically engage in spear phishing attacks. Uh, you mentioned deep fakes. So it's a kind of warlike situation where both sides are starting to use AI and uh, at this point, we are still far away from human level performance, so people are involved, but eventually you can see how it becomes AI versus AI. So um, one uh, clear, one serious uh, uh, point you keep mentioning in some of your papers and some of your work is the larger level of threat AI as a technology can itself possess, right? Uh, you know, I mean, uh, as I mentioned, something uh, people like yourself as well as people like Nick Bostrom uh, have all reflected upon. So uh, what are your thoughts on that? Especially uh, something I think you will be very familiar is people will be asking you, when is the ASI coming up, right? When, uh, when, when that the, whenever the machine machine is going to rise up. And whenever I speak to someone who has no uh, previous knowledge on the field, the first thing they bring up is something like Matrix or Terminator or something like that. So what are your thoughts uh, on the existentialist threat AI uh, generally brings to and uh, how i mean i know isi is, is a far uh, way out there but can we expect an agi at least in our uh, our lifespan it depends on how long you're going to be around uh, <laughs> i'm hoping to make it but uh, it, it really develops very quickly it used to be that 2045 was a consensus date for many predictions uh, it seems that the progress we're making lately is kind of exponentially bringing this maybe even closer. But the main point is it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, seven years, 20 years, the problem is the same and the difficulty of a problem uh, basically means we need all the time we can get. Uh, I think it's a much bigger problem compared to cybersecurity. If you have a successful hacker attack, you lose a credit card, you get embarrassed, that's it. You move on, you get a new credit card. A uh, system smarter than anyone controlling nuclear weapons, controlling power grid can cause a lot of damage. So it's a much more serious problem. So now I have seen uh, something we generally sp uh, speak these days is the uh, situation with game store, uh, the, the share, uh, the game store and it's the how it, uh, how the whole uh, Reddit, uh, you know, uh, community created this uh, artificial value for this particular particular stock. So uh, do, don't you see uh, those kind of, uh, uh, how do you say, attack on financial systems can be easily done with algorithms? Uh, is, isn't that a threat we should be addressing before we 
uh, speak about uh, you know like the i think the government is looking into the people who acted behind these kind of things but what are the possibilities an algorithm doing something like that so already most uh, stock trading is done by computers something like 85% or more of all stock trades is either high frequency trading done by machines or a strategy based uh, machine learning based trading so really we already seen machines uh, have uh, crashes of the market flash crashes and uh, it's uh, very likely to continue and become even more dominated by machines if you have a smarter system capable of outsmarting all the human agents in the market other uh, ais in the market the possibilities are endless in terms of how much profit you can generate and it's possible that uh, crashing the market and bringing it back up is a very nice way to make money quickly if you can predict that by causing it yourself uh, that's that's a great opportunity so we definitely need to have much better regulation to to protect against that so speaking about uh, regulations uh, do you think uh, uh, we will be uh, anywhere anytime close to reaching a uh, general cons- consensus you know in global terms uh, in, br- in bringing regulations i mean it's not just uh, i mean we generally speak about responsible ai you know every organization speaks responsible ai principles right like it, it should be accountable uh, you know uh, uh, transparency you know there will, i think every organization has five or six principles and they promote them but uh, so far i have you know we are, we are yet to have a global framework on regulating this kind of use especially uh, when it comes to also uh, automated weapons as well right uh, you know like drones or people are speaking about you know swarm uh, systems uh, so what do you think how you know do you uh, how do we reach that point where we can create a framework a so globally applicable framework two steps in that process one is agreeing in regulation and i think that's possible that's doable with some negotiations we have successfully created similar uh, documents in un about human rights anti slavery health rights the second step is how does it actually impact reality and if you look at uh, success of those initiatives not much just because everyone agrees we need human rights doesn't mean everyone gets human rights just because we all agree ai should be safe that doesn't do anything for ai so you have to be very careful separating this uh, bureaucratic attempt at uh, bringing together some documents versus situation on the ground where this actually impacts uh, safety we have laws against computer viruses we have laws against spam email you ever get any spam i get lots of spam so there is multiple steps we need to succeed at so uh, we as you brought up human rights you know i think we can have all the rules we want and then there will be some actors who will totally ignore it and go on their own way and speaking about that china is a very prominent player in ai right at this moment they are making many huge strides and according to their uh, Uh, you know the plans they wanted to be uh, at the forefront when uh, in, when agi comes around right so uh, how do you think uh, you know how how much of a threat this kind of situation i mean we have even seen with the the crispr situation with china so uh, do you think uh, just having this uh, frame you know framework like we mentioned is enough or how can you uh, like how can you ensure that some countries like china or uh, korea north korea will go out and create a rogue ai system right i mean down the future Yeah, well you can't and also we don't know how difficult the problem is how hard is it to create a gi if it's really hard and you need a lot of resources like manhattan type project billions of dollars resources then at least you know who the players are big multinational corporations countries like china russia us but if it's actually an easier problem like uh, it took one person to create the whole crypto economy bitcoin i know india is having a lot of fun with that right now <laughs> but if that turns out that agi is actually very easy simple formula you just need some time for the seed to grow into a more mature system then you can't have regulation if a teenager can do it in a garage on a laptop uh, it's meaningless to talk about uh, censorship or control so uh, generally when when you you know when i have conversation with people and tell them you know as every technology ai has a uh, negative side people are quite unaware of it you know they only only look at the what what is mostly uh, described in news stories right for example when the alpha go got the win over lisa dole it was celebrated very very well 
right? Or recently with the COVID virus, you know, many AI agents working in that terms. So, uh, but according to you, what will be the major threats? A, you know, a, let's say an a, 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 you know, artificial general intelligence or an artificial super intelligence that we don't have any control over can create. This is for our audience who are mostly students. So, All right. So I have a paper arguing that you cannot predict accurately what a smarter system will do. If you could, you would be that smart. So I cannot tell you exactly what it will do. But the general pattern is that whatever we design a system to do, it fails to do exactly that. We want a self-driving car to be safe. They have car accidents. We want a spell checker to correct your words. They introduce wrong words, misspellings. They make things worse. I have a paper surveying all this AI failures throughout history, and basically that's, that's the pattern we see. As we have more such systems, as everyone is using them, we see more and more problems uh they are not uh, very resilient to any modifications in their environment if something changes you get unexpected side effects so i i have uh, read in some of your paper uh, the concept of uh, ai confinement you know and ai boxing and things like that can you explain are they uh, are they a solutions we can look forward to in terms of addressing these challenges it is a tool for AI researchers to do investigations into different aspects of a system before it's uh, deployed. It's a temporary measure. When we study computer viruses, that's what we do. We isolate them from internet. We see the inputs, outputs, what server it communicates to. We're trying to understand what's going on. Same with AI system. If we box it, we can control learning data. We can control social engineering attacks. But we know that long term it will escape. If you observe a system, if you actually benefit from a system, information leaks out. And if you don't observe it, it's useless to you. So. You know, many of the papers and many of your works I was going through, it, it, it fascinates me that, you know, I mean, I thought there were very few voices in the world who try to bring out these issues. And it's, it's you know, when I see more more prominent, strong voices in this field, it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of gives me a, a you know, comfort, actually. And um, I have a personal question to you. How do you, did you get into this particular area? You know, I, I mean, we have so many computer scientists, you know, uh, professors, academies, and they seldom get into an uh, area like this, and so they seldom are vocal about this big long-term uh, problems. So, uh, can you just give me a short idea of how, what was your journey? How did you get here? Uh, sure. So, my PhD work was uh, in biometrics. Uh, most people know about fingerprints and face recognition. I was doing behavioral biometrics, how to recognize someone by how they interact with a computer, voices, uh, gait. And uh, part of my work was on game strategy, how to recognize someone based on how they play games, style of play in poker, for example. Online poker, if somebody hacks your account and starts uh, doing something different, we can easily spot that. I realized that more and more players are actually bots. They're not humans, they are very dumb bots, but uh, I quickly realized they're gonna get better. And with years now, the best players in the world are computers. But the point is, I was developing safety systems against bots, and the question naturally became, how do you scale it to much more capable systems? Uh, that's fascinating. And uh, uh, I think uh, in this world we live, you know, where surveillance systems are becoming very prominent, and uh, I, I wasn't very much aware about behavioral biometrics, you know, bio right? Uh, so uh, do you think, uh, I mean, the the challenges of uh, the you know like talking about privacy and security itself right our data is being collected in many forms you know through many channels and using this kind of technologies it's it will be very easy for a for, for a, let's say an algorithm to imitate one behavior online isn't it so yes we will see first of all systems pretending to be humans acting like a human in fact i think california passed a law saying it's illegal now for bots to do that We'll yeah. see how well it works. But also you can steal individuals' behavior, copy someone's. If I have your profile, if I know exactly how you act, and we know that uh, social networks know you better than you or your wife or your parents know you. You need uh, six clicks to predict so much about you. 
so we can imitate your behavior and more and more your voice, your face, your likeness. Uh, so yes, in a way we can steal your personality. I think it's an irony, isn't it? When you speak about uh, intelligent systems, Turing test is considered to be one of the gold standards. And, uh, you know, where an AI can convince a person it's not an AI. And now we we have that uh, crisis uh, around the corner, right? Imitating a human's behavior. <laughs> so uh, another uh, challenge I have uh, came across uh, with this rise of machines, uh, as we saw, is the economic impact. We mentioned about its, its impact on the stock market and other things. But as you know as more more uh, systems are more jobs are automated you know and more jobs are transformed there you know the already we generally speak about the huge gap between the top 1% and the rest of the 90 you know the income gap and there are, you know some countries are even uh, even nowadays trying out something like universal basic income and systems like that so what will be the economic challenges we will face when we get into the gears you know the next gears you know more with more automations and more algorithms are deployed across industries. So with a big assumption that we can actually successfully control super intelligent yeah. systems, then yes, uh, labor becomes free. Physical labor, cognitive labor can be fully automated. So something like unconditional basic income is necessary to provide the basic needs, food, water, clothing. But what about uh, unique items uh, such as uh, I don't know, waterfront properties? There is a limited supply of them. So you still need some sort of a barter exchange system, something to make it possible, at least for some people, to uh, acquire those uh, more uh, difficult to produce items. And one of the ideas I had was, uh, again, predicting where technology is going to be in the future with virtual reality becoming indistinguishable from real world. Uh, a lot can be done which is not real, but uh, to you feels and provides experiences which are in fact quite easy to generate. Okay, now you have this beautiful view out of your window. You have a waterfront home. Congratulations. <laughs> it reminds me of the brain in the what uh, thought experiment, right? <laughs> you know, I think that's something uh, people like Elon Musk has pointed out. There will be a chance that we are living in a simulation, you know, of a future uh, human intelligence. But uh, do you think uh, there is a way? I mean, uh, everything has to be this uh, you know, sphere inducing. Is there a way we can safely, you know, create systems and find a balance, right? We have find a balance between uh, like like what we have seen so far with technology, right? We tend tend to offload the most boring job, right? We got, I mean, we don't like doing laundry. We have washing machines, right? We don't like doing, you know, uh, some other jobs. There's a machine replacing that. So, do you think uh, we will be able to find such a balance, right? Some jobs will be machinized, but then also we will get to have that uh, human nature and live the way we are uh, meant to live. So even today, there is a niche market of man-made products. So if something is made by hand, it's more expensive. Maybe it's not even better quality, but people like this idea that it's not mass produced, 3D printed. So there is always going to be a niche market for real human labor and real human communication. Is it big enough to sustain everyone? Probably not. With uh, boring jobs, we don't mind so much them being automated. OK, I don't want to do dishes, let the robot do it. But the problem is then you do intellectual labor, interesting work we both enjoy. If a machine does it a million times better, I feel terrible about myself. I feel dumb. No matter how hard I try, my work is garbage. So that will change how you see yourself, how you value what you do in life, purpose. And that's much harder to address. I, I I want to you know since you mentioned the handmade situation I, re I remember watching somewhere that the Rolls Royce is the highest cost how this stripes being brushed with a man and it's not a machine it's a man who makes this and they fly this man across the world wherever you need that light so but uh, the one big concern uh, you know our, our major audiences are students and aspiring entrepreneurs and young people who has is about the future of jobs you know many people come and ask, you know, will there be a job? You know, what are the, uh, you know, out of school students are now asking, what are the areas I should get into right now? So I will have a job like 10, 20 years down the line. What will be your advice on that? So surprisingly, it turned out that a lot of very simple, apparently jobs are not so simple. So if you are a plumber, for example, 
everyone has different pipes. It's very hard to automate and they get paid really well. A uh, plumber makes more than a professor for sure per hour. So consider those jobs where automation is difficult. Stay away from jobs where it's a repetitive task. If you're doing something exactly the same, we can teach a machine to do it, automate it. So being a little company accountant, things like that, there is no long term future. Try to be unique. Try to always do something creative. That's your best chance. It's not going to be forever, but you may be the last one to lose your job. Yeah. Uh, so uh, speaking about uh, th that also, uh, that we, we generally see that there the, the jobs that require more human connection, right? Like uh, nursing, uh, teaching. There are the jobs that will have more, uh, you know, more sustainability. I mean, till we have, uh, you know, perfect humanoid uh, AI robots, but. Uh, so uh, another uh, thing uh, I want to ask you is, uh, you know, I mean, we we generally we spoke of, spoke about responsible AI principle, and we can uh, you know how ethical principles, you know, all those things created. Like, but we don't have any guarantee that any an AI algorithm will uh, follow it, right, uh, or obey it. So now you uh, apply these things in a global scale, you know, in a, like like we had with the nuclear proliferation, right? We had these rules that nuclear technology shouldn't be transformed between countries, but look at that, you have around a dozen of countries with nuclear weapons right now. So how, how do, what, what are the threats of AI uh, technology being transformed as a form of weapon, uh, right? You know, can be used as uh, automated weapons as well as for surveillance for, uh, you know, like big regimes, you know, other authoritarian systems. Can we do something about it? Stop so it. it's already happening. There is definitely already existing surveillance systems and weaponized uh, AI, uh, autonomous drones, uh, killer robots, all that is taking place. And in many cases where it's not, it's a decision which could be quickly reversed. There is a human in a loop. They say approve, but they don't have to. And the moment they realize you can shave a couple seconds off of the decision time and outcompete your enemy, uh, the human is gone. So the machines start engaging. It is very scary because uh, they are not only powerful systems, they are optimized for a certain purpose, and the purpose is to kill people quickly. So uh, I think it's in the best interest of all countries to agree not to develop those. The problem is uh, little countries with no chance of developing it, they agree. Sure, we don't have technology, we're happy with it. But uh, US, Russia, they, they go, hey, I have it and no one else does. Maybe we're not going to sign yet. So this is problematic. So I mean, uh, when we speak like, uh, you know, look at Asimov's law of robotics and things like that, right? And don't harm a human. That's the one of the biggest tenants. But when you create a weapon, its job is to kill an enemy soldier and he himself is a human, right? Isn't there is a ethical issue there? Right. And the problem, of course, is that uh, if you design it well, maybe it's better than a human soldier. What if it gets hacked? What if the uh, recognition algorithm is uh, not optimal? Okay, it says kill all the bearded guys. And, you know, uh, it confuses enemies with. Uh, so it's problematic. Uh, so is there any hope after all? I mean, uh, uh, you know, we, we, you know we, we look into this scary situation, but is there any. Uh, you know, with all these security challenges and safety issues, uh, is there any, uh, you know, I mean, can we pull together and create a better, better future? I hope so. Otherwise, uh, what I'm doing is not very beneficial. My hope is that we will find ways to balance uh, problems with amazing benefits of this technology. We can get, again, economy into trillions. We can do healthcare research, life extension do amazing breakthroughs in science. So it's a very valuable tool. We can make humanity uh, much better, much happier, much healthier if we do it right. So um, and, uh, as an uh, academician, can you give me a brief glimpse on the work you are doing currently? What are the research work you are doing, the papers you are doing? I think I came across your book, uh, you know, a few days back. I haven't received my Amazon uh, delivery. I think I, I should wait for the time and drones will drop my shipment. <laughs> so the delay can be avoided. So what are the current projects you are working on? So my latest work is trying to understand what are the possibilities, what are the limits in this space? Uh, I work on trying to understand, can we predict what such a system will do? Can we explain the decisions it makes? 
what does it mean to control a smarter system? Can we control it? So all types of limits on what's possible. We know about limits in physics, limits to speed, limits to observability. There are similar limits in almost every field, economics, decision theory, mathematics, and computer science and AI. And I think it's a very much under-researched area and I found very strict limits on what is possible. So we know theoretically we cannot achieve certain things, which gives us more uh, concentration of our resources and what is possible, what is important. And we know that certain things should not be done because we can't control them. So, but, but uh, uh, what about uh, you know, the technologies like quantum computing? You know, you've been generally said that it, can, it will be an exponential leap in uh, computing, right? You know, the number of simultaneous computing process can be done is like huge. So will that be another thing, you know, will add to the existing development of AI systems? It, it definitely has possibility of expediting learning and training. I don't know if it's a requirement. It seems that a human brain accomplishes quite a lot, possibly without quantum effect. Some people argue that it's not the case, but it seems like even with today's systems, we do better than human in many domains. Vision driving is already dominated by machines to a certain degree. So it may make things quicker, but I don't think it's a fundamental change to have quantum computers. So, uh, you know, it, it, it was uh, fascinating uh, talking with you. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's good to have the reality check once in a while, you know, as much as we like to profess about the benefits of AI, you know, it's a, it's a double sword uh, you know, technology with, uh, you know, like, the, like we speak about uh, the Democles sword, right? It's over your head, anything can uh, happen. And uh, I mean, uh, if you look at the recent developments as well, I've, you know, how much of the things are automated, right? These days, I don't send any email replies. There will be a reply <laughs> suggested underneath, right? That's okay, you know, I wish you were, you know, like. So uh, it's, uh, it's a fascinating time to live, but I hope uh, people out there uh, will follow some of the ideas that uh, you, yourself and people like Bostrom and others put forward so that we can uh, have a, a, you know have a better future so how do you think i can convince someone right when i have a you know i hope we can get more people on board i think a mass consensus will be very very key to bring a legal framework or to have a general idea you know a public opinion right to ensure that these systems are uh, used properly so how can we ensure that will happen how can we get more people aware of these challenges so that's what I'm working on. A lot of what I do is to kind of show what the problems are and uh, kind of get people to understand how quickly this technology is advancing. I think the more everyone experiences this type of technology and if they experience some sort of accident, it, it makes them think, oh, if this level of technology generates this level of problem, maybe it's going to progress to where it's more damaging, it's more serious. So I think until you personally experience something, it's very hard for you to relate uh, just uh, from exposure. So in a certain way, it's good to have small problems now than huge problems later because it might be too late at that point. Yeah, anyway, it was a pleasure talking to you, Roman. And I hope I will get an opportunity to meet you in person. Uh, you in India, you know, you're uh, much welcome here once we get past this uh, new normal or uh, <laughs> this difficult phase we are living through. And I very much enjoyed reading your uh, paper. Looking forward to reading your book. And I hope more people will get inspired and become cautious about the harmful, uh, you know, about this big, you know, and understand the bigger picture of the you know, negative effects AI can bring to us. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's a, it was great talking to you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I look forward to coming and educating and per person. Yeah, thank you.